Well, good morning. Welcome back to our hour of worship here at Fairview Moravian Church. Be you a visitor or a member or wherever in the world you're logging in on or, or dialing up, we welcome you. We're honored that you've chosen to worship with us on this Sunday morning. And to begin, at this time, I call on Rod back to bring us an important message from our reopening committee. Rod. Good morning. As uh, Marshall said, my name is Rod Back, and I'm on the reopening committee for the joint board. And we have determined uh, with all the studies and we've looked into this that we are going to reopen on July 19th, next Sunday at 10 a.m. Now we have a set of protocols in place that will uh, make it the safest, simplest opening ever. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to clean the sanctuary on Saturday thoroughly, um, every bit of it. Then we're going to have um, hand sanitizers on Sunday. We're going to social distance. There's going to be uh, rows taped off that you won't be able to sit in. We're going to have masks mandatory according to Governor Cooper's mandate. Um, we are uh, only going to use the sanctuary. We are not going to use the rest of the building. That includes the elevators, unfortunately, at this time. We have what we call a no-touch zone. That means when you walk in the front door, you are escorted directly to your seat. You will not be touching anything uh, in the sanctuary uh, except getting into your seats. We feel this is the safest way to keep social distancing. Um, the other uh, major issue is if you have a fever, a cough, shortness of breath, or any other health issues, um, or are uncomfortable with our protocol, please stay home and tune in and watch us online. That would be the best. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to send this all out uh, via mail, via email. We'll put it on our website so everyone can know what the protocol will be next week. And it's going to be at 10 a.m., and it's going to be here in the sanctuary. We're thrilled to have a reopening and um, hope it all goes well. As, as we all know, there are things going on that we have no control over. So we're going to go forward at this point. Things may change. We don't know. Um, there is a possibility in the future we open part of the building. We'd use the elevators. That's all unknown at this point. But at this point, we're going to use the protocol that we have developed, and it's the safest, simplest way to do it. So we all welcome you next Sunday, and we'll be here. I hope you are. Thank you. Can't get this straight here. Okay. Rod, thank you. Uh, I just can't say enough for the job that this committee has done. Uh, Rod and Bill and Jerry, uh, these, these guys have met, they have read volumes of stuff that comes out from the government and, and as you have heard, they have very carefully planned this reopening out. Uh, we, we can't wait. We very much want to get, get folks back in this sanctuary again, worship in person. but. Um, we want to do it as safely as we can. One good thing that's come out of this is that we have some new equipment here that's going to enable us to stream our worship services live. So as Rod said, if you're not comfortable with this situation, you're free to just sit at home in your living room as you have been, sit in front of the computer or sit there with your phone and listen to the service and watch the service unfold live. This morning, once again, it is our pleasure to welcome Bill Shields back to our pulpit. Bill is no stranger to you, either here at Fairview or at, at one of a number of other churches around Winston-Salem. But Bill is one of our own. He has accepted the challenge of preaching from the Book of Romans this morning. God bless him. Bill, welcome back. Very eager to hear your message this morning. This whole business of the coronavirus pandemic and how it has been restricting our worship and canceling church activities has, we believe, has handicapped our pastor search process a little bit. 
No pastor could be blamed for not wanting to make a change or to take on the challenge of a new church under these circumstances. If our members are frustrated at the length of time this process is taking, I promise you your joint board members share that frustration. But we are pressing ahead as best we can. This past week, the Provincial Elders Conference uh, met and discussed our needs. Joint boards have scheduled a meeting uh, this coming week and hoping that uh, we can meet together with the president of the PEC. We will do our best to keep you informed as we go along. And now let us worship God. Thanks again for uh, the great committee work, Rod, that uh, your committee has done. It is so positive to have a uh, plan in play that uh, provides for a safe and secure worship sanctuary, and it does feel so good to be in here. I think there are many people that, that really miss uh, being in the sanctuary and having that personal worship with God. And thanks again, Marshall, for your kind words. Um, it's always an honor to be in the pulpit at Fairview Moravian. For our prayer concerns today, and there are many, um, and I'll just go through these one by one. Um, please keep Jody Brindle in your prayers. He had knee replacement, and this was done on Tuesday. He is at home and doing well. So please remember Kimberly and Lily and Stella. Uh, please keep Linda Mather's brother, Fred McKinney, in your prayers. Also, we need to especially pray for Tootie Barber. She is 
having to move to a more skilled nursing facility and apparently that's very unsettling to leave where she currently is. So let's really uh, uplift Tooting you for a piece of heart. Continue to pray for Will Wright, Bill Wright's son, who was in a serious car accident recently, and especially keep Bill in your prayers for Bill, uh, for Will to stay at Bill's house. Uh, continue to pray for Bob and Erlette Peak. They certainly um, need our prayers. Please continue to pray for Pam Tatum's cousin, Celie Schaefer, and her friends, Gail Arnett, Luke Whitler, and Ken Carden. Uh, also, Ann Hooser just learned that she broke her ankle. She is at home. You may want to drop her a card. Please keep George Francis in your prayers. He had recent hip surgery, and certainly that's not an easy recovery. Please continue to keep our shut-ins and members of our nursing homes in your prayers during this difficult time. It's certainly been difficult for many of those who have had shutdowns and have missed uh, even going out, but things are gradually getting back to a little bit more normalcy. Uh, Please keep our joint boards and the PEC in your prayers as they continue being led by the Holy Spirit during this difficult time. And last but not least, I want a special uh, prayer for Lucy Milliken. She had an asthma attack and is now at Forsyth Novant Hospital. She had congestive heart failure. She definitely needs our prayer. So please keep Alan, Diane, and the entire Milliken family in your prayers. May we now bow for prayer. Dear Lord, you know our hearts. You know all those who have needs, some express, some unexpress. Please bring your comfort and healing peace to all those that need your healing. Please bring your strength to those who are struggling. During this difficult time of the COVID-19 health crisis and with the unrest and some of the violence and chaos that we've experienced in this country, oh Lord, please cleanse us, restore us, revive us, renew us, refresh us. We need a revival in America. Please draw us closer to you and fill us with your Holy Spirit. We thank you for going to the cross of Calvary and making us one with you. May we remember that it is only by your grace that we are saved through faith, through God's precious gift of love. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Today's liturgy can be found on page 133 in our book of worship. Please join me in the liturgy of evangelism. Holy, 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 the Lord Almighty is holy. God's glory fills the world.
God of creation, whose love invites all people to receive the blessing reserved for us since before time began. Grant years of faith that each one may clearly hear your gracious call. God of salvation, whose love encompasses all humanity, who assumed flesh and blood and died that all may live. Give eyes of faith, Lord Jesus, that everyone may plainly see you among us. God of inspiration, whose love initiates new ways of reaching out to all who risk believing. Guide our lives in faith that we may willingly become your instruments of love and truth. With gratitude to the Lord, we remember our rich heritage of committed servants who carried the good news to their neighbors throughout the world, who followed Jesus' command, go to all people and make them my disciples. We thank you, eternal God, for those who have come before us, faithful to the great commission. We praise you for imparting to us the same mission to bring others for Christ. With humility before the Lord, we confess our sin. When we fail to communicate Jesus' promise of new life, when we have not reached beyond ourselves with the word entrusted to us, when we retreat into comfortable sanctuaries and do not seek to be a light to the nations, when we become preoccupied with church involvement for its own sake and do not labor to proclaim salvation to the ends of the earth. Forgive us, we pray. When we fail to recognize that the measure of success is not only in the number of constituents, but also in the sincerity of conversion when we are too timid or afraid to speak the gospel message to those you want to hear it, when we allow of life of ease to divert us from those who need your love through us. Forgive us, we pray. Touch our lips with the burning coals of your forgiveness. And let purify our hearts. The Lord your Redeemer says, now your guilt is gone and your sins are forgiven.
Throughout the ages, God's call to mission summons a response. We affirm our heartfelt yearning to reply. God asks, whom shall I send? Who will be my messenger? And like Isaiah, the answer flows from our soul and forms on our lips. I will go, send me. God, our Redeemer, we share a longing to minister as partners, together with you and each other. Our desire is shaped by your will, our commitment molded by your covenant. We dedicate ourselves again this day. We accept the challenge joyfully to proclaim Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. We covenant with you to be loving instruments of understanding and forgiveness among those to whom you send us. We promise anew to be living invitations for others to meet you as Lord and Savior. We press on with resolve so that your word may spread rapidly and you may be glorified everywhere. We must work the works of him who sends us while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. We will go send us. God invites us to be generous with our time, our talents, and our resources so that God's word spreads in the world and bears fruit in each life it touches. Let us give joyfully and generously, sowing seeds of the kingdom. Let's pray. Generous God, we bring the gifts we have to offer to you, seeds of goodness you planted in our lives which have flourished, Bless and multiply them. Help us to choose wisely how they can best serve your purposes in our church and in your world. Amen.
Good morning. Our first scripture this morning is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 55, verses 10 through 13. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there until they have watered the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led back in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall burst into song and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle. And it shall be to the Lord for a memorial, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Our second reading is from Matthew chapter 13, verses 1 through 9, and then verses 18 through 23. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, The evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. 
As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. Here ends the reading. Thanks be to God. Now our next hymn is hymn number 771, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. I would be remiss if I didn't thank the choir for the beautiful music. It is just amazing how not a whole lot of members, but they sure do make a beautiful sound. And for Lewis and Nancy's playing and Van Krause, thank you for your fantastic trumpet playing. May we open with just a quick prayer. Dear Lord, thank you so much for allowing us to be here in your house of worship. I pray you will just open our hearts so that we may Hear your word, and may it truly fill our hearts with your Holy Spirit's guidance. Just continue to bless all those who are sick, all those who are hurting. We know you are the great healer, and your Holy Spirit is there to comfort us. Thank you again, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I am so honored to be in the pulpit it's uh, always a highlight, and I did a little soul searching. I love the passage that Linda read from Matthew. I just love the book of Matthew, but I love the book of Romans, and Romans 8 is such a powerful chapter. It's got one of my favorite verses in there, and it's not in our text today, but 
think a lot of people love Romans 8, 28, for God calls us all things to work together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Just on the ninth, I had celebrated my 16th year sobriety anniversary, and it was just the grace of God and the Holy Spirit and power meant that allowed that to happen. And that may have been why the Spirit led me into Romans 8, because this is truly about new life in the Spirit. Let's hear our words. Now, I'm going to actually read the last two verses from chapter 7. As you'll see, there, therefore is continued on in 8.1. So I'm going to read chapter 7, verses 24 to 25, and then get into Romans 8.1. This is Paul's writing. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with my mind, I am a slave to the law of God, but with my flesh, I am a slave to the law of sin. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ has set you free from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And to deal with sin, he condemned sin in the flesh so that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the Spirit, excuse me, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on things of the Spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For this reason... The mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. You are in the Spirit, since the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin... The Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through His Spirit that dwells in you. Amen. May God bless the reading of His Word. Does your conscience ever bother you because of a harmful action from a hurtful, hurtful word spoken or for some sin you committed. As Christians, we should care about kindness and forgiveness and love. And when we do something that's wrong, we'll usually experience an inner reprimand or a chastising by the Spirit. The Lord will always discipline us when necessary. When our harsh words or unkind deeds hurt others, I think they wound Jesus with pain to his heart. Daily, I'm speaking from personal experience, I fall short, very short. Sometimes to the point that I felt that I've disappointed my Heavenly Father. But in reality, we all make mistakes through errors, some in careless thinking, others in poor judgment, and if we could go back in time, we would do things very differently. But fortunately, we have a merciful and loving Heavenly Father. And the amazing truth of the gospel, there's nothing in our lives that we've done that God will not forgive. Our sovereign Lord is always willing to wipe out the guilt and remove the sin. God's grace and love shown to us are truly beyond our understanding. Now, in Paul's letter to the Romans, which was written from Corinth in A.D. 57, he wanted to provide the church with the strong dose 
of gospel doctrine and truth. Paul had never been to Rome. He was certainly hopeful of going. But his primary theme is really twofold. It's a revelation of God's righteousness, and then it's his plan for salvation. In this beautiful work, the apostle truly discusses our sinful nature. You heard a lot about that as I read about nature and in the flesh. But Paul stresses that through God's grace, we may be transformed through the Holy Spirit. Romans 8 is one of the most beloved chapters in the Bible. Its verses provide reminders that our loving Father is gracious and merciful to all His children. For believers, we have Christ as our Redeemer, and we are free from God's judgment. We are all sinners, but we will never be condemned as sinners. We cannot be separated from His love. Jesus' blood covers our sin. And as we sang earlier, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Amen. We are secure in His grace. There's a heartwarming story told about John Simpson, the well-respected 19th century Scottish surgeon and scientist. One day, Dr. Simpson, he was out walking in the town of Edinburgh, he was then approached by a young man with a probing but pressing question. Dr. Simpson listened carefully to this inquiry, and he was asked what he regarded as his greatest discovery. Now, many people would think that he would say, oh, I've done some difficult surgery that he performed and I healed a person. Still others may think, oh, I made an amazing scientific discovery. Instead, this prominent but humble man of God simply said, my discovery and the greatest discovery in life is that I'm a sinner, but Jesus is a great Savior. Is that not a wonderful proclamation of faith as we start our lesson this morning? Now, and our assigned lectionary scripture for today from the Romans 8, 1 to 11 passage it does have quite a bit of in-depth information. But as I read the last two verses in chapter 7, we have this therefore, which is a continuation of thought from the previous verses. I thought we would just kind of get a brief overview of chapter 7, just so we'll get a better understanding of chapter 8 in our first 11 verses. In 7... Paul made it clear that the law of Moses is holy and good. It reveals how sinful we really are. But becoming a Christian, it gives a person power to overcome sin. And that's in Romans 6, 17. But it does not make one sinless. We are all sinners saved by God's grace. And Paul described in details in many of his verses that in following God's law, it, it showed him the necessity to be delivered from his sin. And he learned firsthand it can only be done through faith in Christ in power of the Holy Spirit. So Paul, and I think really the uh, King James says it best, O oh, wretched man that I am, O oh, wretched woman, you could say either one, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then we get into this beautiful chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, as I'm unpacking some of these verses, we're going to examine them a little closely now. Verse 1 really is talking about, shows God's mercy, shows His love, because He does not give us what we deserve. I think the beautiful thing about this, and this really warms my heart, there's no sin that a believer can commit, past, present, or future, that can be held against him or her. The penalty for our sins has been paid by Christ at his supreme sacrifice at the cross. We have been justified by faith through God's amazing grace. 
think that's why I love John Newton's Amazing Grace so much. And for those in Christ Jesus, for every true believer, to be in Christ means we are united in Him. Just like we're united together in fellowship, we're united in Christ. How good is that? Now getting into verse 2, this is another beautiful verse. And I read most of these from the New Living Translation. I think it, it gives a little bit better uh, understanding and puts it more into uh, life today. Because you belong to Christ, the power of the life-giving Spirit has set you free from the power of sin that leads to death. Now, what is that saying? I thought long and hard and prayed, and I finally discovered that it shows we are delivered through death by the resurrection of Jesus. And if we're in Christ, sins of our past no longer have dominion over us because we've been set free by his saving work. There was a time in my life I'd worry about all the things I did. I would pray for forgiveness. I would pray, oh Lord, and I just couldn't let them go. And then I finally realized that as we confess our sins and we humbly repent and come to God and look to Jesus, he forgives us. It's that simple. And we know in Christ... As believers, we will spend eternity in heaven. Andrew Murray, the great pastor and missionary from yesteryear, and my wife Gwen has bought me several of his books. In fact, I found the story in one of them. Thank you, honey. There are two powers, the power of sin and the power of the Spirit. Which is stronger? Many Christians believe the power of the flesh is stronger. God tells me through Paul the power of the Spirit is stronger. If I will trust Christ, the Holy Spirit will make me free from the principle of sin and death. Now, it's not the question of sin being eliminated. Sin remains to the end, but the Spirit in Christ makes me free from sin's power over me. Now, my enemy is still there, Murray says, but he can't touch me. The Holy Spirit can fill the believer and make sin powerless. Now in verse 3, another, another uh, difficult verse, it includes a little bit of the Old Testament. It says, the law of Moses could not save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God sent his own son in a body like we sinners have. And in that body... God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his sin as a sacrifice for our sins. Now, God's commandment, often referred to the law of Moses, was never meant to bring salvation. God's, God didn't give this law to save. He used it to reveal our need for grace. In coming to earth as a baby, Jesus, fully God, became fully man. And because he was completely without sin, God's condemnation of our sin was poured out on Christ, on his sinless flesh. Christ was our sin offering. How beautiful is that? And you can imagine what he suffered for us. Now verse 3 it continues into verse 4. God did this at the cross... So the righteous demands of the law might be fully satisfied in us who live according to the Spirit and not according to the flesh. Now William Barclay makes a wonderful clarification. I think you'll enjoy this. Throughout the book of Romans, Paul is not using the word flesh in the sense of the body as we say flesh and blood in all its vulnerability and weakness to sin. What he really means is human nature. Human nature. So to live according to the flesh is to live a life dominated by the desires of sinful human nature instead of having a life dominated by the love and directives of God. So I think that was a good thought. Now in verse 4, we see because of what Jesus did, we may now walk in the power of the Spirit. Hopefully, we can make better choices for ourselves, for others, but especially for God. 
Now, we will always sin, but if we stay prayerfully close to Jesus, we have a spirit to lean on. Moving forward into verse 5. Now, this is where it gets a little bit trickier. For those who are dominated by the sinful nature set their mind on sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. That's a wonderful verse. I think it gives us a good choice. I think it's a pretty easy choice. Live for sin or live for life. I think that's a good choice. I think what it really amounts to is what really motivates us in our walk with Christ. If we primarily want to pursue things of the world and sinful human nature, that's what will drive us. That's a lot of people of the world live that way. They don't think about any consequences of their sins. But if our main desire is to seek and follow the things of Christ, we can be in tune with His Spirit. And being prayerfully led by the Spirit, we can try to do His will, which would be pleasing to God. Now, verse 6 is another dynamic one. Listen to this. Letting your sinful nature control your minds leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. Now, I don't know about you, but I want a life of peace. I don't want anything that leads to death unless I've got Jesus. And we know we do as Christians. So if we allow the Spirit to lead us and we try to discern God's will, I think this will help us achieve serenity in our soul. Now, that's not to say that every decision will lead to peace. We'll have many tests and trials in our faith journey. There'll be bumps in the road along the way. I mean, just the prayer request we had today, there's so many things that come up. One day, everything's going smooth. The next day, things just fall off. And with our health crisis, as well as the difficulties, the chaos, things that are going on in today's world, we have tough decisions to make. I look at our board now. Our board's trying to call a senior pastor and you know, we're just praying that the Holy Spirit will lead us in that capacity. But sometimes doing right can lead to heartache. Can I get a witness for that? But if we prayerfully go to our Lord... I think this is the key in building a meaningful relationship. And the more we go to Him, the more meaningful our prayer and relationship becomes. One source I read, and I really like this, in the broader picture, when all is said and done, making choices for God by the guidance of His Spirit will paint a canvas of life and peace, which is our life on earth and our life in heaven to come. Never really thought about that, but when we get to heaven one day, we're going to have peace and a lot of joy. Now, I'm putting these next three verses 7 to 9 together because they really go together in a group. And again, this is from the New Living Translation. For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey the laws of God, and it never will. That's why those who are still under control of their sinful nature... Never please God. But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You have the Spirit of Christ dwelling within you. And you are controlled by His Spirit. Now if you think back in the time of Moses of the Old Testament, the times from Abraham, Moses, all the way through Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, how often did the Israelites fall short? They sinned. They were punished by God. They were put into captivity. Eventually, God had mercy on them, and this would go on and on and on. Well, we're blessed that we have the New Testament, which is we have grace. So as believers, we should desire to please God. We live in the world, and you may have heard this before, but we don't have to be of the world. I think the devil comes after us as believers in subtle ways, Peter talked about it. And the devil comes around like a roaring lion looking to devour us. It's out there. Sometimes we see it. Sometimes it's very subtle. But he enjoys taking us down. And he makes these passions for immoral living and lusting after worldly desires. He makes that look so 
wonderful when he says, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. But before we received the grace and his spirit, our human nature was inclined to human deeds and sinful deeds. But now with Christ, we have things controlled by the spirit. Now, I like what John MacArthur had written about this. He said, throughout Romans, Paul uses the word dwells in his writings. And you'll see that, that the Spirit of Christ dwells within you. John MacArthur says, this word dwells refers to being in one's home. The Spirit of God makes his home in every person who trusts in Jesus Christ. And I really like that. In fact, my... Uh, at time when I was working at Reynolds and I was just known as Brother Bill, I had many people that would ask me, Bill, what's, what's really the Holy Trinity? And, you know, it's, it's a complex issue. And the way I would explain it, I would say, well, the Holy Spirit is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three in one, one in three. But the way I always look at it, I pray to God and He's the Father I pray that my walk with Jesus, and I try to envision Jesus and I walking together arm in arm, I pray that I'll be blessed with that, and then I pray to be empowered by the Spirit. So that's the way I've always looked at that. So I love this word dwells, as the Spirit dwells in us. And Hudson Taylor, that great missionary to China, he added, what we want to have is an open ear to the Spirit. Always ready to hear and obey the precious one who has taken his abode, his residence within us. Well, I sometimes don't hear things as well as I should. I think my wife will attest to that, but I certainly am, am trying. And in line with these words, I think as we prayerfully ask his spirit to take up his residence within us, I think that's when Jesus really lives in our heart. And I think sometimes he wants to remodel our lives. He maybe make changes that he knows are best for us. And yet he really just wants our trust and obedience. Now in completing these, let's look at the last two verses, 10 and 11. Which say, and Christ lives within you, even though your body will die because of sin. The Spirit gives life because you have been made right with God. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead, lives in you. And just as God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same spirit living within you. Now what is this saying? Thought long and hard. I think what it's really saying is, as believers, we're saved by faith through grace. We're assured of salvation. If we've led a spirit-filled life, we're going to be rewarded by spending eternity with our Lord in heaven. He's got this unconditional love for us. And he's even given us Jesus' path for us to walk. And if we stay on it, it will lead to our heavenly home. I think we need to remember after Jesus died and went to the grave in the three days and how many people were worried. Well, God certainly didn't forget about Jesus because his greatest miracle was he raised him from the dead. He overcame Satan and the victory's been won at the cross. He will never forsake us. And when our earthly life expires, we will be immediately in his presence. But it's our choice to make. Will we live life by our sinful human nature or will we live by a spirit life in the faith? Now, in Paul's last letter before he was beheaded, the aged apostle wrote these inspiring words of hope to Timothy, his son in the faith. I've shared this many times with people, some in hospital. I've got some wonderful feelings of peace from these last verses that Paul wrote. You know them. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give. That's 2 Timothy 4, 7 to 8. I think if we've lived in Christ-like ways, God's going to be pleased by our actions. 
and think how rewarding it will be as we one day enter the gates of heaven to hear these words of Jesus, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. I will put you in charge of much. Enter into the joy of your Lord. And that's from Matthew 25, 23. I want to share this true story that really touched my heart from Max Licato from his Six Hours One Friday book. True story. Pastor Max wrote, Nothing drags more stubbornly than a sack of failures. Sin is fatal without the forgiveness of God. So what do you do with the stones from the stumbles in your life, from your errors committed? When my oldest daughter Jenna was four years old, she came to me with a confession. Daddy, I took a crayon and drew on the wall. Max says to himself, kids amaze me with their honesty. I sat down, lifted her into my lap, tried to be wise. I asked her, is that a good thing to do? Jenna quietly said, no. I asked, well, what does daddy do when you write on the wall? She answered, you spanked me. So I asked her, what do you think daddy should do this time? This little Jenna looked up her dad and said, love. And don't we all want that? Don't we all long for a father who in our mistakes that are written all over the wall will love us anyway? Don't we want a father who cares for us in spite of our failures? And we do have that type of father in God. We have a father who is at his best when we are at our worst. Let me say that again. We have a father who is at his best when we are at our worst. And Max concludes, he says, a father whose grace is strongest when our devotion is weakest. If your bag is big and bulky, you're in for some thrilling news. Your failures are not fatal. Now in closing, what truths have we learned from these verses? These are 11 pretty, pretty tough verses. As we've been striving, striving to live in the Spirit day after day, gave this a lot of thought. And I truly came to the conclusion that when we have a Spirit within us, our key in harnessing that Spirit empowerment is by daily prayer and by our quiet communion with our Lord. Now that includes Bible reading. That includes the little things we do. But I think the two main things are prayer and our quiet communion with our Lord. That's how we harness His Spirit's power. I think there's this true spiritual connection between prayer and what God wants for your life. I've seen it firsthand in my own life. When I was stubborn and selfish, I constantly had heartaches. When I finally hit bottom and God pulled me out of my hole and started leading me by the Spirit, I gradually got peace. You know, I think there is a true connection there between the two. And I think if we have sincere prayer and we humbly come before His throne of grace, we confess our sins, we pray for repentance, and forgiveness, and He sees we're truly humble and we're truly genuine, I think we'll better understand His plan. I think when we pray to God, He always listens. He may not answer right then. He may not even answer yes, but He definitely is going to do what's best for us. And if you remember a great verse in the Bible, 1 Thessalonians 5.17 Pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing, which means we can pray often during our regular activities. My absolute conclusion now, Pastor Charles Spurgeon, who many say was the greatest preacher since the Apostle Paul, he wrote something that really touched my heart and which really includes what we've talked about. And I think this will sum it up well. If Jesus Christ our great Savior, if He needed to be anointed by the Holy Spirit, how much more do we? How much more do we? 
But there is another thing to be done as well. And Spurgeon says that is to pray. There is a distinct promise to the children of God that their Heavenly Father will give them the Holy Spirit if they ask for His power. The Lord must give His Spirit when we ask Him, for He has bound Himself by no ordinary pledge. Oh, let us ask Him with all our hearts, and I pray that some who have never received the Spirit may now be led while praying, Blessed Spirit, visit me and lead me to Jesus. Ask God to make you all that the Spirit of the God can make you, not only a satisfied believer, but a useful believer who flows the neighborhood with love and blessing. Amen. May we pray. Our Father, we all struggle with weakness and sin. We all need you and we need Jesus. We have heartaches and disappointments. We have illness. We have death. We have hurt. We invite you in, O oh Lord. Enter into our hearts. In you, we will find relief from all that has bound us. In our times of physical weakness and emotional distress, we need your comfort and your strength, O oh Lord. We have so much sin in our lives. We need your grace. Sin has taken a horrible toll on humanity in our world. There's so much violence and anger. Please help us to put Jesus first so that we will have you first in our life and we know that you will guide our way. Forgive us, our Father. May we remember that in your grace, you not only forgive, but you wipe our slate clean. Thank you that you know our weakness and you love us all the same. In Jesus' name, amen.
May the Lord bring His countenance upon you. May the Lord bring His joy and peace into your hearts. May the Lord lift up your spirits. And may He truly bring all things in love to you. In Jesus' name, Amen.